Stage Show, a show committed to equipping you to hone your media skills better to stand out from the crowd as a go-to expert in your field. Each week, Rich Montreger interviews top leaders, influencers, authors, speakers, podcasters, and media professionals about how to leverage media best to help you shine brighter on camera and stage as a go-to expert. Now, here's your host, The Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Welcome back on this Wednesday night for another edition of How to Rock the Stage. It's The Trigger, Rich Bontrager. We are back once again to talk about ways to help you shine on camera, shine on stage. But tonight, we're going Hollywood. Now, we all know the Hollywood strike is going on. The writers, directors, actors, it's a big mess out there. However, tonight we don't have just one guest. We have two, count them, two guests, writers, directors, editors. They are artists in their own right. And tonight we're going to dive in to going behind the scenes a little bit, taking you backstage with Hollywood, have a little fun here tonight. So don't go anywhere. We do want to thank the sponsors that make this all possible each and every week. Of course, the National Speakers Association, the NSA, they're celebrating 50 years. The National Speakers Association helps speakers become better speakers, influencers, and creators. Learn more about the NSA and learn how powerful they can help you elevate you and your brand message by the power of public speaking. And of course, Autovita Studios, Autovita Studios is powering Rock the Stage now. They have an experienced team paired with their state-of-the-art remote recording process, which brings your message to market faster. They work with you to produce your audio books, your podcast series, and distribute it throughout the social market. For more information, to learn more about Autovita and how they can help you, go to autovita.com. So the sponsors have been thanked. We're ready for a great night, and we're going Hollywood. Let me introduce you, first of all, David Woods. He's a screenwriter of full-length feature and television shows whose content ranges from comedic to dramatic, the majority of which are original content or public domain adaptations that are told in historical fiction means during the present to the semi-recent days. David is the studio manager of the 8th Cinema, and 8th Cinema is an independent film studio that focuses on three of the most important things of film. The script, the script, the script. (laughs) <laughs> we'll get into that in a minute. And then William Boldell is with us today, a writer, director, editor, who has won numerous awards and had his work honored by the American Cinematheque. He is working on his first feature as a writer and director. He has also, by the way, been involved with Sharknado. Plus, he's done behind-the-scene directing work where he, he takes you behind the scenes. So all the cool stuff that we want to geek out on. Welcome, David Woods, as he comes beaming on in here. And hey. William Bodell, how you doing, guys? Hello, how are you? Doing well. I do. I've been chopping on the bit to get on here, so uh, pardon me if I'm just a little a trigger happy, you know? <laughs> well, you know, you've been talking about this for two years, David. Shame on both yeah. of us for not getting this done earlier. Well, there have uh, been a couple of world events that have kind of uh, put a couple <laughs> obstacles in the way, but that's still no excuse, yes. And William, when, when, that, when I was doing some bonus work i saw you edited and worked on shark needle that's right yeah i helped create the beast you really did (laughs) yeah it was a quite a surprise uh it was a film that i it was one of my first films editing and i thought nobody's gonna see this it'll be a great opportunity to learn and uh wound up being uh, uh an international phenomenon so that was that was a nice bonus International phenomena, but do you consider it one of those? Um, oh, how 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 should I say this? B rate classics now? Oh yeah, no, it's a total, it's a total B movie. It's a it's a film that, uh, you know, we were signing on to it. We knew it was a bad movie, and how you know the idea that the, that I approached it with was how do I make this fun? How can we make this fun? Um, a lot of B movies are kind of boring, and so that was that was my goal was to make it so that uh, people could hear the title Sharknado and then watch it and and feel like yeah, I I, I feel like they delivered something there. Um, it is it's a funny 
phenomenon because it's like, well, it's a bad film, but it took a lot of work. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done. And, but looking at it, you would have no idea because it just looks like a mess. So um, it was something that literally we dragged kicking and screaming into being a film. It was barely, it, when they finished shooting principal photography, they maybe, maybe had 60% of it shot, maybe. And so we had to fill it with, with stock footage and VFX, and we had to go and keep shooting things and make plates, and even those had problems. And so it was a real, you know, it was a real journey and a learning experience for me. So, but I'm very proud that we made a film that cost a buck fifty and got the attention of a two hundred million dollar film. That that I'm extremely proud of. And uh yeah. It's, it's not, not anything in our control. We just did the best we could with what we were given. And those stats, they don't lie. So, no. yeah, those are, <laughs> you need to take a, a film class, you should look at Bill. What did Bill do? Oh. How did he do it? If my, <laughs> my reputation is, well, I should say, if my MO is based off of Hitchcock, the script, the script, the script, I'd say it still wouldn't be possible without the editor who was able to be the backbone, who was the DJ, right? So, yeah, this is... A lot of a lot of um, a lot of respect needs to go to you without like most people don't even acknowledge that. I know there's categories for it, but oh, still, yeah. wow. So, yeah, so thank you. That's very nice of so, you. Thank so, you. Let me rewind a little bit and just ask David first, and then mm -hmm. William will come to you. But what got you into this crazy business? Because it is a crazy business. So why, David, did you want to get involved with it? I uh, started in high school, actually. So I, it's not like I, I had a attention deficit disorder or anything like that. It was, you know, high school, you're distracted with a bunch of stuff. And so I found the, the secret to high school is to don't pay attention, pretend like you're paying attention, but then do all the work later. Do it at home, do the reading, do the extracurricular, oh, here's more homework. Do that, skim through it, and then come to class, and fall asleep, read comic books, write scripts. And that's where, that's where it started. Yeah. So. That's a common theme for many of us that fell into the media, comic books right there. That, that's a very strong commonality. What about you, William? How did you get pulled into this? Was this always part of your dream? Yeah, so writing and directing is always the final goal. When I, when I approached editing, it was as a means to get to uh, directing. And, but I love editing as well. So I love, I love all three of those processes. They're all one thing to me. When I was a kid, of course, I loved films, as so many do. And I remember still sitting on my legs, trying to look over the person in front of me in the movie theater because I was too small and just being transported, like forgetting that I even existed. Um, and I thought I was going to be a lawyer at first. My father had uh, ideas about what I should do. And I, my parents separated when I was about three. I went to live with my mother at one point and she said, well, you know, you could do whatever you want to do. And my head exploded. And I thought, well, I'm reading about talking about, you know, eating, sleeping, breathing films. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should do something there. Maybe I should just, maybe, maybe this is a, a viable path. And so ever since then, it's been my obsession. My story is really similar to yours, actually, because oh. the same thing happened with, with my mom. She, uh, I went to a babysitter over summer, maybe uh, going into third grade, and Jim Carrey's The Mask had just come out. And she said, hey, what did you do today? I'm like, I'll tell you, from the beginning to the end, and just quoted the movie verbatim, act <laughs> one, act two, act three. And she said, how many times did you watch this? I'm like, just once. But this movie's hilarious. Trust me. This is good. Let's watch it. So... Wore, wore it out, wore that VHS out multiple times. So, yeah. Fun, baby. So, so, really, both of you are involved in story making. It's really about story, story, story. Now, we blow things up, we cry, we fall in love, all these other things, but why do you want to tell a story? What, what pulls you to a story? Because, because you're both writers, you're both directors, creators. Why story? Uh, well, the reason I want to tell stories is, is to, honestly, this is going to sound pretentious or maybe a bit naive. I really want to help improve people's lives, whether it's in a small way, making them laugh, entertaining them, 
or opening their mind to things or really actually there are films that I went to as a, as a kid and even that I see today, occasionally I see a film that literally changes the way I think about the world and in a positive way. And that's what I would like to do. I would like to affect positively as many people as possible through this magical medium. I think Fritz Lang called it, he said the camera was a, a diabolical device, right? Because his perspective was always very dark in terms of like the stories he told. But I think he called it diabolical because it affects you in ways that you don't even realize. And if I can take that power and, and improve somebody's life and show them how wonderful they are and how much potential they have to do what they want to do, whatever that may be, that would be extremely satisfying to me. What about you, Dan? I'm right there with you. I'm exactly right there with Bill. Uh, I noticed that when you're telling a story, especially a joke, people pay attention and don't interrupt. Like they might interrupt with their facial expression, but they don't try and be critical and break it down as you're saying uh, a hilarious joke. So if you give an anecdotal story or say a parable like what Jesus did, or you have, you can tell by their face if they're into the story or not. And so that's how you hone it in and say, oh, wait a second, this is how to not get interrupted. Beginning, middle, and end. Well, and like you mentioned the fact the number one tool that Jesus used was storytelling. The number one tool that most politicians use is storytelling. It's the most ancient tool of communication because if you're a great storyteller, you go from the head to the heart. And when you get the heart, you have them, right? Yes, absolutely. So, David, you, you work on script, script, script. How do you get from head to heart when you're designing the script and story? How do you work through that process? Like, well, it's making, fall, having you fall in love with the characters and then say, why are they doing it? What's that desire? What's that motivation? And the second you have that question of why and you're seeing someone else, you sort of uh, project yourself onto that person. Right? Not, not in a, a literal sense, of course, but it's more like I'm, that's becoming a piece of me and I want this person to succeed. Oh, I have that, that separation of space uh, because I know that it's, that it's fiction, but I can apply those principles to my life. It's just like reading a book. Fantastic. And right now, the current state of Hollywood is in a total disaster. We're, we're, we, we all know that. It's all over the news. I'm curious what each of you had to say about the current state, because streaming content is exploding. I'm a streamer. I work with streamers. We create our own original content. We're not Hollywood, but the streaming world is a big deal. Let's start there. As original creators, talk talk to original creators right now because Hollywood is shut down, but we're still producing original content. How much leeway and growth do you do we, do you think we have as streaming creators, William? What do you think about this whole new world? I think we're at an unprecedented, you know, a juncture in in media. Period. And and because of what you're saying with streaming, but also because of you know the effect of the internet on everything just in general, in terms of publicity, in terms of how we reach an audience and why we reach an audience, in terms of, of the kinds of stories that are told, whether it's on TikTok or in a feature film, you know, a lot of, a lot of younger people don't even watch young, uh, feature films at the moment. I think that's gonna change back. I think they're gonna go back to watching feature films more as well, but just the amount of different kinds of ways to communicate through streaming is incredible. Obviously now with the strikes going on with SAG and WGA, there's a lot to think about in terms of how Netflix completely changed the business model for everybody. And other companies were running to, to catch up with what they thought was a successful business model with subscription. And now it seems because nobody's been looking at the stats, yeah, because they can't, because Netflix isn't obligated and the other are Apple or yeah. Amazon. Now they're seeing, wait a second, did we just jump off a cliff here? Like, what are we doing? And yeah. uh, is that going to trash our business? And, and how are we going to um, share revenue with actors, writers, uh, et cetera, as we have in the past? So, uh, and, and sorry to talk so long about this, but I think it's a really fascinating topic. Oh, it is. Oftentimes when technology changes so drastically, uh, really interesting stories are told. Whether it's, you know, 
the invention of cinema, the invention of sound with cinema, colorization, all of these things brought forth a whole new way of looking at motion picture storytelling. I say motion picture because I know it sounds old timey, but really it kind of applies to any kind of a visual, aural visual medium. And um, so it could be, like I said, a TikTok or, or a feature film or an episodic on streaming somewhere. It's, it often breeds a lot of invention and also economic decline in a business often also breeds uh, storytelling invention, which happened in the 70s, which is my personal favorite uh, of American cinema, it is when the studios didn't know what people wanted. And then all of a sudden, a bunch of hippies and, and counterculture kids made, you know, Easy Rider. And it grossed through the roof. And then they said, who's... Who are these people? Like these kids know what the audience wants. Yeah. They don't want to watch pillow talk right now. They want to watch stuff about counterculture or whatever. And that changed cinema forever. So um, I'm very excited about the possibilities. David, what about you? You should have known it was a big deal when Netflix dropped Bird Box in Bright. And then you saw the world's reaction. Right. But then they're like, hey, look at, look at these stats in terms of Who's watching it? Not necessarily yeah. money made, but who's watching this? Everyone's talking about it. Everyone is watching it. Everyone is sharing it. More people are watching it because it was shared. So, hey, I think they might be onto something. And then to do it again and again and again, that means take notes. I think we're at that point where, again, as original content creators, we have a huge open door that jumps into the void that, sad to say right now, Hollywood is going to give us. We can do, there are no regulations. There, 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 there are no rating cards for streaming content for independent creators. We can really create anything we want. And right now we're hungry for new content, aren't we? Right. Yeah, I was talking with somebody who works in, uh, she, she produces an evening talk show. And a lot of the news items that she gets are filmed on a phone. Literally filmed on a phone. <laughs> Uh, it, technology and streaming in general are just changing things so fast. I don't even think we realize how, how monumental this is this time. Period. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but isn't there now a category for awards of independent films done on iPhones and miniature apparatuses? Is there an official award now that I thought there was? There's definitely festivals. I don't know about the awards. That could absolutely be the case. But I've heard of festivals that cater to you want to make a movie on a phone? We're going to make the whole festival about that and, and how you can and scroll back a couple of years. When did that happen? Yeah. When Tangerine came out, everyone laughed. They're like, no, you can't make a, a movie on an iPhone. Mm -hmm. oh, man, we put great, make some adjustable lenses, take set seriously, work on audio. Yeah, yeah, you can. And now look where we're at. So. Well, right. I mean, look what I get to do every, every day, every week. I'm streaming live, creating my own studio. I get to be the new Ryan Seacrest every day. Mm -hmm. There's no limit to this life right now, is there? Wild, wild west. I think now, the democratization that's happening is really exciting. Now, I also think back, being a Star Trek geek, I grew up on Star Trek, but I can remember reading as I grew up about the residuals. William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, the cast, they had their likeness everywhere. And they were not getting residuals of the animated show, the original show. They were just reruns and no money. And they literally went to Paramount and CBS and said, enough. Hmm. You're still working on us and making great bank off of us. And we now know they're almost 60 years old doing the same thing. They fought for the residual rights to get payment. Does it feel like we're back in that same conversation with the streaming and the AI discussion that – we're at that breaking point of something's got to change. Yeah, they did a radical change back then. You touched on something very important, is that the, the artists were not the business people. The business people knew what they were doing and said, hey, well, this is what the price was to come through this avenue. And then, oh, is it fair? And there was never a discussion of fairness because that's not part of the contract. So... For, for me, I know both sides. And yeah, I'd rather be on the high CEO of a big studio. But that's, not, that's not where I'm at right now. And then also, you need to treat people 
with dignity and respect to pay them what you're, what they're owed. And so this t- conversation is not new, but it needs to be happening. And now that we're in it, yeah, this is definitely what you need to do because this is, it happens in multiple industries. John Henry, right? Steel driving man, whether he was a real person or just work of fiction, it was the argument machine versus actual manual labor of working on the railroads. So, yeah. When it comes to the future of this, if you, if you look in your crystal ball right now, where do you think the independent market blends into Hollywood and everything else? What are, 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 are they going to come after this and say there is a rating card? There is a standard now? You independent guys just can't keep going on forever? Or do you think we always are going to have a separate wall? I think there will always be independent production. Absolutely. I mean, you can't have, I mean, you can, but hopefully we will never have only six companies running everything that we see all the time because it's, it's already almost there, right? To some degree. So, so now, as you said, you can be Ryan Seacrest. I can go out and make a movie for much less than a Hollywood studio and it has the chance to be seen. Now it's difficult because Hollywood puts you know, basically you do, the, the rule of thumb is you double the budget. If the movie costs 200, then it's going to be 200 just to promote it. Now, how do you compete? The question is, how do you compete with $200 million of promotion? And how do you get distribution that people actually know, oh, this exists. I can go watch this. Yes. So, so it's, it's tricky, but it absolutely, uh, I think there will always be independent production. And I, I think oftentimes that's where, that's the vanguard of the form. Oh, yeah. If you want, if you want a good story, go independent. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. 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 Exactly. You want quality? Oh, you might not have heard of this movie. Check it out. Whoa. <laughs> that was really impactful. Yeah. And it seems like some of the studios are even leaning more to the independent. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Apple has more of an independent flavor sometimes on some of their stuff that some of it seems to be smaller studio or independent vibe and then someone else slaps their label on it to turn it into a bigger production but some of apple stuff seems like it's kind of out there a little bit more than independent and, yeah and i i started watching so i i actually don't have apple but i have a writer's group um and we read and evaluate and, and write constantly and every week we meet and one of the scripts that we evaluated was severance and that is such a unique oh. out there show that i was really impressed by the pilot it's so good it's so well written and it's so inventive and intriguing so you might be right i, I don't know a lot of apple content but um i you know that show really impressed me just script alone i haven't even seen the pilot i've just read it so let's just talk about genres for a minute because you guys both play in similar genres but do you each have a favorite one that you like to hang out and live in comedy really why david yeah because if you want to get to the heart break someone's heart you need to do it while making them laugh so is that kind of the mash idea? Because mash was comedy, comedy, and they would hit you with a zinger. And at the end of mash, you were thinking, this is really thought heavy now. I'm, I'm done laughing. Now I have to be heavy the rest of the math. Mash was a genius at that. Is that kind of what you're pulling for? Yeah. The, the reference that came to mind the second you said mash is Fresh Prince, the original Fresh Prince. Yes. There was an episode where uh, it was when Carlton had the gun. Right. Oh yeah. And you didn't you didn't know if he was done with the vengeance and would let it go, or was going to take matters into his own hand. And it seemed almost out of place. And then it was left it was to be continued, but they never continued it. But we still talk about it in 2023. Well, yeah. because it was a very intense, out of the box, controversial. I mean, there was some some people that didn't want to air the show. I can remember reading about it. They're like, we're not touching this. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's happened uh, since the 60s. You know, name, name all those shows. Uh, the Jeffersons, uh, different strokes. You would never, I, I don't want to say never, but that type of new idea, and let's show the world of, two di- people in the world, two different spectrums coming together under one roof. Yes. Uh, unlikely friendships, right? Yeah. Then you have the, the close similar vein of the Buddy Cop movie, right? There's 
two people clearly are not from the same place, mm -hmm. but they have two different ways of doing something. And by the end, they're, they're best friends, right? That's almost the same thing. And it's funny because some people almost think comedy is a short content. Because most of them are 30 minute television comedies. They are a little bit shorter, even on the cinema, very often. But comedy doesn't have to be short content, does it? No, no. no it's just really hard to do and do well and consistently because it takes a level of uh, not grasping the low hanging if you want to keep people on it and say, oh, we're, we're not a one trick pony. So you know, I'd say just think harder. Let's see you do that, AI. Ooh, don't get me started on that yet. Uh, <laughs> William, what about you? What, what's your favorite genre? Well, I love all genres, but my, my focus in terms of creating my own content, or my own, sorry, my own stories. Some people don't like that word. I don't mind it. But anyway, stories. Let's say stories. Uh, suspense thrillers. Uh, Dave mentioned Hitchcock earlier. He's one of my idols. I'm absolutely yeah, yeah. interested in that sort of um, playing with the audience in terms of you know, laughing, then scared, then crying, then back to scared, then laughing again. I, I think that the suspense thriller is, uh, and, and there's, there's no way you can't bend it or twist it to do something different and interesting. There's just so many possibilities with it. You know, I love everybody from David Lynch to the Coen brothers when they do a uh, thriller. Well, yeah, and there are some really good ones out right now. Uh, you know, I, I've been watching um, Sweet Tooth. It was an independent kind of thing that's on Netflix. Hmm. You have not seen Sweet Tooth. I'm telling you, that's amazing. But the okay. roller coaster ride of this little kid is a mutant against the world. It's a great story. Okay. that's He's like a deer, right? Or something? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's got the deer, the antlers, and a bunch hmm. of other kids. And they're trying to hunt him down. But it, there, there's humor. There's laughter. The kids are excited to be together but it's a really complex great story and yes there's so much you can do with the power of story and doing that well mm -hmm. people love a good yarn don't they? absolutely <laughs> absolutely and the the thing that's different about I, I i do believe that there are only so many stories but i believe that there's infinite ways to tell them so so as many people as exist you know there there are that many at least that many ways to tell them you know and it's exciting you, to see the different voices. Did you just talk about Sun Tzu, Art of War? I didn't intentionally do that. Okay. The, the, the flavor <laughs> palette. There's only, there's only five the ingredients, but them. an infinite flavor palette. There's only five notes, but an infinite melodies that you could create from those five uh -huh. notes. Yeah. I so, agree. So, I agree with Sun Tzu. A, a ancient general. But again, <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> there, there are shows that have been able to do that though. They've been able to take similar topics and twist it, so twist it, come back at it. You know, Star Trek again, 60 years. Mm -hmm. They've written every possible time travel, science fiction, lost love, everything. They've done it numerous times, but we keep coming back for it. Right, yeah. And I love the, the philosophical bent and the very humanitarian bent that Star Trek, at least original Star Trek and Star Trek Next Generation. And, you know, the, the very best of Star Trek to me when it's really working is they're thinking about how do we get along? How do we, how do we reconcile our differences? How, you know, and why are we here? I mean, they're, they're tackling big questions, you know? Huge questions. Yeah. Right. So you guys are both directors. Some directors are my way, shut up, do the scene, <laughs> get back in there. Are you guys collaborative more of let's see how you interpret how you do it? Where's that line between letting them take on a role and you directing to get what you want out of it? David, I see you're smiling. Pretty uh, I just want to say, for, uh, yeah, for, first and foremost, you did some deep research and <laughs> like you're, you're touching on things that I didn't tell you about. So I'm saying kudos, kudos I to know you, my stuff, man. man. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> Because I don't typically tell people I direct. Yeah, so I would just say oh, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a producer. But yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, big ups to your 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 research and development team. <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, I so personally, I'd say live the role. So if you're able to, if as a director, I'm teaching you uh, the the vision that I have in mind. And then you, as the artist, is living that out. 
And so if you're able to be in there with the, you know, the motivation, the emotion going into that scene, and then the point of the dialogue and the script, if you have a different idea of it, I'd say, yeah, take it. Try, try one. And I won't, I won't scoff. I'll play, I'll play along as if you had written the dialogue or came up with that thing, even if you just improv it on the spot, because that actually might be truer to the source than what I originally had in my mind. What yeah, about you, William? How much leeway do you give in that? Uh, I give quite a bit of leeway. I, I basically have an idea of what I want, and I definitely try to steer people in that direction initially. But at the same time, I'm open to actors, you know, PAs, the caterer, whoever. If they have an idea and it actually tells the story better, I'm there for it. I absolutely am. And if you're not doing that, I don't understand what you're doing as a director. Like, because then that means it sounds like you're trying to tell a story with your ego as opposed to the ego of the story. To me, it's about the ego of the story. What does the story want to be? If you're not listening to that, then you're not doing your job. Well, and does who, the story who has the last line? say? Sorry, give, uh, David, sure. go. Well, yeah. I, I'm kicking this towards Bill for a second because I already know he knows the answer. <laughs> Who would have the last say of what makes it in the movie? I mean, yes, it's going to be the director, et cetera. But you know what? Who ultimately has the last say? The audience. So, And, and, I, and I feel like if you're listening to your story and the story tells you something, um, it can only benefit. It, it can only benefit from you actually taking as many ideas as you can from the, the talented people around you. I mean, you're hiring these people not just because you like them, but because they are talented and they want to tell the story with you. And, and you know, 20 brains or 300 brains are better than one as long as it's focused. And that's the director's job. The director is literally, it's such an easy uh, metaphor. It literally is the conductor, right? But you have amazing violinists. You have amazing tuba players. You have an amazing percussionist. To not take that talent and harness it to go in the direction that you want to go, it's absurd. So of course you're going to take all of the talent you can from them and 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 hopefully focus it. That's the job of the director. I love that because I have heard about scenes that after they did the way the director wanted, the actor or actress says, "I got this idea. Can can we just try it? Roll tape and let's just see." And they go completely where they wanted to go, and in the final cut. They use the one take that was off script. For sure. Because the essence, the emotion, the reality of the actor own the scene so much you had to use it. How often does that happen? All the time. Like literally. Every, every time. Yeah. It, John Ford said the best things in his films are mistakes. And he is regarded as a master. Martin Scorsese does rehearsals before he shoots and they will take things from the rehearsals that the actors just invent on the spot and they will put the best things into the script. And then, you know, so that becomes part of the development of the film that's being made. They're always listening. How can we make this better? How can we tell the story better? It's actually a, a sign of high intelligence to be able to roll with the punches when you already had a concept in mind. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes the story morphs as, as you're shooting it. The story takes on a life of its own, right? Yes. You either yeah, go sure. with it or you hold it back, don't you? Yeah, the Hollywood sort of uh, the thing that people say is there's the story that you write, there's the story you shoot, and then there's the story you edit, right? All of those, and I think that's actually what Dave was alluding to earlier, was probably that the editor has the final say. I would say to a degree. Like it's it's the editor, but, but it's always the, the thing is, the director is the conductor and the director conducts everybody from the script, hopefully, to the sound mix, the color, everything, so that it all comes together. That's their job. It's not to, to tell the story that, that says, I am a great artist. It is to tell the story that says, I'm a great story. It's the story telling them through everybody else. Um, sorry, I got a little off track there. I feel no, like no, I'm no, 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 no. Get off track. Get off track. <laughs> keep going. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> so, yeah. When it comes to speaking to younger people that are looking at actors, directors, movie, um, what would each of you say to those people that are wondering, could I, should I, 
because it's a hard business. But then you hear amazing stories of people who took the risk and did it. What would you say, David, to someone who's thinking about, you know, I want to pursue this, but there's not a great landing pad to catch me on the backside because it doesn't work out. Yeah, that's, I would slow down on that last part and say, really think about that. If it doesn't work, would you be fine with it? Because this is, this is a path of, you need to have thick skin, you need to understand rejection. And then also how much are you willing to invest in yourself? How much is your story worth? If you're going to sell it for $10, well, then it's only worth $10. If you say, oh, actually, I wouldn't sell this for more than $10,000, and no one ever gives you $10,000, what are you going to do then? Oh, if you thought you had a, a great story and it goes and you get a million dollars, was it worth a million dollars when you were going through whatever it was to get there? Right? So let's say, what, what value do you think you have and are you going to compromise with that value? David Goggins, famous Navy SEAL, influencer, sports sports guy, was a, uh, I don't know, have you heard of him? Motivational speaker, David Goggins? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, look him up. Uh, he said when he was a teenager to mid-20s, if he were to sell his life story, he'd sell it for a quarter, like 25 cents, because that's only how much value he said he had. But then when he finally wrote the story um, for, uh, man, what was it called? I'm blanking on it, but uh, uh, Can't Hurt Me, for Can't Hurt Me, he it originally went for $300,000 advance, right? And he said, no, it's worth way more than that. I'm not going to take $1,000. And most people said crazy for not doing that. He's like, yeah, I know, but I through all these trials and all these tribulations, my value went from 25 cents to a hundred dollars to a thousand dollars to half a million. Right. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to go for $300,000 even when I don't have a half a million in the bank. And so that's wow. something that you should really wrestle with first before committing to that, because there are going to be times where you broke, <laughs> you're really broke. Right. Uh, but what do you believe in yourself? If you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel and you're already exhausted, are you going to still run? That, that's up to each, have, each person. I've heard story after story of actors waiting tables, sleeping in their car, bunking with a well, another well-known actor, but they get nothing themselves. It's a climb. What would you say, William, to give some advice to someone who's like, I want to do that? I think that the answer is in your question. If they say, I want to do that, how badly do they want it? Uh, because if they're going to get into this business, they better want it bad. Uh, and I mean that in the sense of like, I think some of the most honest answers I've heard from successful filmmakers are, is, because uh, I hear it over and over is, I can't do anything else. I have to do this. And they're not doing it because they know that they're going to be rich or they know that they're going to be successful or they know that they do it because they are driven, they are obsessive. <laughs> And not necessarily all, it's not always, you know, peaches and cream. Like it's, it's, um, it's a hard path. And I think the people who are successful at it are, are usually the ones who are driven by some kind of fire that they maybe can't even explain completely. And uh, they're just going to do it, whether people are listening or watching or not. I've heard a lot of those stories too, where they're like, I have to, right? Have yeah. To. Yeah, have their choice. It's, it's yeah. almost like a magnet is pulling them and they can't stop going that direction. It's highly impractical. It makes no yeah. sense. Like when you can go and become a doctor or a businessman or, you know, real estate agent, why would you do this? It doesn't make any sense because especially now because the economics right now aren't making sense. That's one of the reasons why you're seeing all the protesting. Yeah, um, a lot of, you know, in the past, you could make independent films and have a decent financial life. Mm -hmm. Now it's much harder. Uh, and and so you really have to want it. You have to be there for the right reasons, I think, uh, to, to stay in the to be in the game and to stay in the game. And stay also there are those people who are successful and then you never hear from them again. 
So that's also what I mean by success can be as much of a trap as, as you know, mistakes or failure if, you're, if your head isn't in the right place. That's a great point. What about you, David? Yeah, I was going to say, I would just piggybacking off of what Bill said, go, go down the, the list. How many people got famous and it destroyed their lives? Right. How many people mm-hmm. had to go to rehab? How many people had to get psychologically examined and take some time off? Right. This is not something that you should take lightly in terms of, oh, I got to this point. I can, I can kick back. I'm famous. I'm rich. I have all those, those dreams. It has to go beyond that, too. So the first part is having the thing you believe in, the movie. And then what does it take to get it made? What will you settle for? What won't you settle for? And then say, well, what's the next project? What do I do when it's time to celebrate? Are you going to go absolutely bonkers? Like it's hangover 15, right? But it's your real life? Yeah. Or are you going to have those parameters up and then the, telling the next story? Yeah. I, I think Denzel Washington and a couple others have made it very clear. They learned early on. There's a line. If you're going to stay in this, you got to know your line and protect that line. Otherwise, you will not make it long term. And I think it's great advice you're touching on, David, because it can take you over. It can pull you in. And you still have to understand where your limit, where your line, and who you still are. Speaking about who you are, I'm curious, what direction do both of you want to go? What, what aspirations do you have for your careers, for your goals? Uh, David, what, what exactly do you really want to do with all this? I feel like I've told Bill this every time we've talked since I met him. It's like, oh, I want to have that ability to be like the Shaw Brothers, Sony, Sony Classic. Right. And just be able to create all this content with no one saying, you know, I don't know if I trust that. I don't know if that's a good investment. You'd be like, oh, well, you can trust us because similar to the Coen brothers, they wrote it, they shot it, they edited it, they put it out, people ate it up, loved it, and they're still talking about these movies till t- t- today, right? So uh, I guess to be more precise, if, if I were the, the director of creator, creative content at Netflix, I would go down that path, taking more risks. But then when it comes to uh, filling those positions, I'd purposely put newbies in it but have a mentor with them, coaching them along the way. So it's not like a full, hey, we're going to give this to anyone, but someone who's aspiring uh, DP, aspiring director, aspiring writer, give them, give them a, spe- a spot, but then also give them advice and walk along that process, almost like a, a mentorship, but then do it in whatever country you're shooting it in. You wanna, I, personally, I want to see the RAID 3, Still waiting on that movie, but I also want to see the Raid Four, which I don't know if it's even conceived. But if there was a Raid Four, I'd say we're going to Indonesia. We're getting Indonesian actors, uh, catering, all this stuff. Like go through the list, everyone who's who's part of the team, and then say, uh, this is what this is the standard that we're at as a studio, but risk it with filling those positions. Wow. Uh, William, you got to follow that one up now. <laughs> I'm really excited to see what Dave does because I feel like his heart's in the right place. And I feel like the, con- the, the stories that he is going to, to tell and help get told are going to, to push, push the envelope. And that's, that's, I'm all about that as well. What I want to do is uh, on, on a, at a director level and maybe at a producer level someday, tell stories that we haven't seen. And, and, you know, as much as I like superhero movies or other things that we have been watching over and over again, yeah. um, I, I think that there's a lot of room for growth of the form. And we're going to see that. Like, I absolutely have no doubt. Yeah. And and not to sound arrogant, but I'm going to be there do, helping yeah. with that. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to help show people, look, you thought cinema is this. It can also be this. And also um, what we were talking to tie it into what we were talking about earlier with, you know, should people get in this business? I absolutely want to encourage people through my stories to follow their passion. That's one of my, my biggest, um, my biggest, biggest interests is, is, is whatever you want to do. If you really are truly passionate about it, you absolutely, the world is telling you, do that thing, do that thing. Don't just don't just get a job where you're going to be safe. 
if you need to do that for a while and then, and then, you know, do this on the side, do that, but, but don't ever stop pursuing that thing that you care about that you love. Don't stop. I love it. Yeah. The, I just want to touch that again. Don't yeah, stop. Please, please. What if, you, if you are going for actor, writer, producer, director, don't stop. Just know it's going to kick you in the teeth. And that's what an obstacle is. And that's, that's mm -hmm. the test. But then it's also the scar that you'll have to say, hey, this is, this is a victory mark, right? Uh, don't let it break you. Don't let it beat you down. Don't let it make you become resentful. And hate all of LA. Hate California. Or, mm -hmm. or New York, Georgia. Well, at this point, really anywhere in the world. Oh, but Vancouver, Georgia, the, anywhere right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't, don't hate it. <laughs> Just realize that there's always going to be a pushback if you want that goal. What type of what type of victory would it be if there was no opponent? Absolutely, it's not even a good story. <laughs> So, David, we're trying to. Yeah, well, this is an interesting one here, David. Sorry about that. But that's David's QR code, the go to. <laughs> we just did our own independent movie right here. Go and check out his LinkedIn page, connect with David, learn more about him. Uh, again, he is at Independent Eighth Cinema, right? Eighth Cinema is, is the Eighth name of your group? Yes. So, learn, learn more about David. And now we're going to do the very same thing here with William. William's got kind of a funky glow looking shine to him in that picture. But go that check guy. out his LinkedIn page as well, guys. Look at that guy. <laughs> oh, you're selling it. I, I have a feeling I know what genre you like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so as we kind of wind down here today, again, this is immensely rich. We're in a time and space where Hollywood is on the world stage, not for a film, not for a story. We are watching something happen in real time right now that someday someone's going to make a movie about because it is going to revolutionize everything we see in here now. I really think we are going to see an explosion out of this that I don't think I, I, I don't think anyone knows what's really going to happen, but it will not be the same. Do you guys agree? Yes, hundred uh, percent. Should we extemporize on that or? Yeah, please, please. I mean, AI, uh, you know, obviously is changing things very rapidly. AI itself is changing very rapidly. And uh, it's really going to be interesting how to see how artists can use it as a tool, but also how they can prevent it from being used against them, which I think is a lot of what, you know, the WGA and the actors are striking for. Yes. Um, you know, they, they and, that, and that's something that applies to almost everything across the world, every field, you know, whether it's business or, you know, if those studio execs who want to use AI think that it's easy to take the job of a writer with an AI, imagine how easy it is to take the job of a studio exec. <laughs> Not to be rude. Sorry. No, but, both ways. I mean, absolutely. Right. And that applies to business. It applies to science. It applies to all these fields where we need a human touch mm -hmm. to always be there. It can't just be you know, AI. And so it's going to be really interesting to see how, how we negotiate that as human beings dealing That's with one this show that we can do together. <laughs> right. That's one, that one. Yeah. Dude, David, what about you for final thoughts, comments here tonight on where this is all going to land, do you think? Uh, I don't know where it's going to land because the, the result, I'd say the consequence of this might come down to who's going to compromise and who's going to settle for what. And this is, you know, a tale as old as time, you know, rightfully so that there is a strike, rightfully so fight for what should be happening. Uh, but at the same time, it's competition. So I, I don't want to get hit in the face again, being in an in, in industry, but I know it's going to happen. I don't want to be rejected again, but I know it's going to happen. I don't want to be sold short and I'm not going to let that happen. So in terms of saying, oh, let's, hit a new standard yeah i'm all for it and i hope i hope it's higher much higher but then at the same time i hope we learn from this and just are able to quote this the same exact moment of of the settlement and say oh, wait a second this feels very similar to what happened in 2023 right this also seems very similar to what happened with you know, not feeling safe on set oh this is eerily yeah. similar to the theft of idea Right. Oh, how come I can't fight back? Well, if I fight back, I'll get fired. 
So these are all moments we should go back to and say, we're learning from this. And then let's not have it happen again. Fabulous gentlemen, thank you for being with us here today. An extra long edition, but this is meeting good stuff. Love to have you both back on for another conversation. There's so much more to dive into. David and William, thanks for taking the time for being here tonight. David Woods, William Bodell, again, they are right now on strike. All of Hollywood, the writers, directors, it's a mess. Thanks them for taking time to be with us here tonight and take a look backstage and what is going on, where it is going, but also what we as entrepreneurs and creators ourselves can now step into. It's great to think that the field's open for independent creators. For those of us streaming, for podcasting, for those that are authors and creators, right now there's a moment in time that we do get to lean in a little bit more, maybe shine a little bit brighter, have a little bit more fun with it. Step into it fully. And until next week on the Trigger Rich Sponsor, we'll be back next week for another edition of How the Rocks is Stage. And again, we do want to thank the National Speakers Association for making this all possible. The NSA celebrating 50 years of helping speakers shine brighter, grow, and really elevate themselves and their brand. And thanks again to Audubita Studios. They're going to take this show and they're going to convert it into an audio podcast. And I'll be streaming live on Apple and many other podcast platforms. And again, if you want to learn more about how they can help you, go to audivita.com. That's going to do it for tonight on the Trigger Rich Podcast. We'll see you back here Wednesday night, 7 p.m. for How the Rock Stage Live.